So, uh, enough of that. Let's get into Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I told you Philippians is one of my favorite books. It's, they were one of my favorite churches. I mean, honestly, when you read through this church and all the things that they do, they're the most giving, loving, caring church. Whenever it's inconvenient, when they are the poorest of the churches, they are the ones that step up to make sure that the needs are taken care of in the church at Jerusalem, uh, any church around the area, plus they send their pastors to go take care of Paul in Rome. I mean, they're just an amazing church. And it's no wonder that Paul loves them so much because they are truly kind of a, a, a I call it an anomaly, they, to be a church like that, you know. Uh, churches don't tend to be that way. I don't know why that is. Ours is, but not every church is that way. But this is an amazing church and how they love Paul. Chapter 3, now if you study the writings of Paul, we always know that in the middle of every one of his letters, he breaks. He'll be teaching you doctrine, and then he'll come to a section and he'll break, and all of a sudden he turns into real practical things. And we're, we've just, we're coming to that right now. Philippians chapter 3 is the break when he says, finally, He's not ending. This is right in the middle of the book. He's not, he's not closing. You don't have to worry. He's not closing on this. He's not, he's not saying this is the last, last thing I'm going to say about it. He's just saying finally, he says, now then, let me move on to this next thing. And uh, he said, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. If there's one thought that runs through the book of Philippians, is the idea of rejoice. Joy, joy, rejoice. And uh, we find it over and over and over again. And what's amazing is Paul is writing from where? Prison. prison. He's in prison. He's bound between soldiers. He's, he's lost his liberty to move around. And yet he says, y'all need to rejoice. Don't be walking around thinking that, you're not, that, that things are so bad, you know. Uh, you, you've got it good. I'm in prison. Good night. Rejoice. Come on, you know. And I think sometimes we, re, we need to be reminded of that, don't we? I do. Uh, you know, I, I, some dumb thing happens during the day. Circumstances dictate to me that uh, I'm not supposed to have a good day. And so I say, okay, I'll yield to that. And so then I'm having to have a bad day. And then I walk in the office and Veronica says, are you okay? <laughs> well, no, I'm not okay. What's the matter with you? Can't you see it on my face? No, no. But you know what I'm saying? And we let things, we let things get in the way. Joy is found in a relationship with God, not in circumstances. If there's anything we need to remember, that's something we need to remember. Because I guarantee you, whenever you're having a bad day, it's because you've allowed your circumstances to dictate your attitude. You're not thinking about your relationship with God. I'm coming out of it. Whoo. Hot. Burning calories, that's what I'm doing. Otherwise... <laughs> I was telling the guys, watch this, watch this. I'm a zipper. <laughs> I never thought I could say that. I know I can't, but it, I am, yeah, I am. I'm having fun. But joy is found in the relationship with God. I mean, if you're in relationship with God, how, what, what could rob you of that joy? What, what could rob you of the joy of walking with the Father? There, the only thing that can is you. You realize that? You can say, well, so-and-so, the work, this, that, and the other. But no, it's you. You make that decision. And we ought not to make that decision. We're God's children, for pity's sake. We, we ought to be the most, most joyous, full of joy people there are on the face of the planet. Because we get to walk with the creator of the universe. I, I can just talk to him anytime I want to. I can talk to him all day long. Every time I turn around, he's right there. I don't have to worry about that. He's always there. What a great relationship we have with him and our circumstances and people can't rob us of that kind of joy, or it shouldn't. So he says, rejoice, what? In the Lord. That's where we find our joy, in the Lord. He says, finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but to you, it is safe. So he's going to write something that he's either preached to them or he's talked to them about before or he's sent to them before. 
He's just saying, it's, it's, it's okay if I have to repeat myself. As a pastor, I repeat myself all the time. Y'all notice that? I don't know if you notice that. Thank you. Yeah, I repeat myself all the time. And, uh, but you know what? It's kind of like the old preacher they, that I've told this story. This is story number 55A. If you know what I'm doing, you know, go ahead and start laughing. But uh, the, the preacher came. They found a new preacher, and they got him to come. And he came, and he, he got up the first Sunday, and he preached a great message. And everybody was just enthralled. Thought, Man, that was awesome. And they left, and they came back Sunday night. And he got up, turned to the same passage, used the same illustrations, told the same stories, finished the sermon. And old deacon in the back, he said, well, it's, it's okay. He's probably busy today. He didn't have time to get a new sermon, you know. And, so the next week comes, and he preaches on Sunday morning, turns to the same passage, uses the same illustrations, goes through the same thing, and he preaches the same sermon. And now they're getting a little bit concerned. You know, this is two weeks in a row. Sunday night, same thing. Next week, he said, you know, next week, if he does that next Sunday, we've got to talk to him. Sure enough, Sunday came around, turned to such and such. Here's the illustration. Paul gave the same sermon, finished the sermon. He walked to the back. The deacon said, we need to visit with you. Sure. What's the problem? He said, we've noticed that uh, the only sermon you preach that same sermon over and over and over again. When are you going to get a new sermon? He said, when you start living the first one. <laughs> he said, I'll change my sermon when you start living the one I just preached. So preachers tend to be redundant for the mere fact that you probably didn't get it the first time, I guess. <laughs> So Paul, and, and there's nothing wrong with repetition. In fact, we learn, teachers know repetition is the way you learn. And uh, I think that's true. Y'all, many of y'all have heard that story before. How many of you have heard that story before? See? I, I guarantee you could probably tell the story, right? You know why? Because you've heard it so many times. And, uh, but uh, I'll probably tell it again. So next time I'll let you tell it. But uh, it's the same thing. He said, it's no problem. I don't mind. It's not indeed grievous to me. Just, I hope you listen. It's for you, it's safe, because you're growing, you're learning from it. Now, here's the message. Are you ready? Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. These are not literal dogs, although I tell you, you need to be careful with dogs. Uh, these, he's referring to a group of people called Judaizers. Now, we've talked about Judaizers before. Anybody want to define that for me? False teachers. What did they teach, though? Do you remember? The what? You have to be a Jew. Yeah, you had to be a Jew first, and that meant you're going to have to be circumcised. You're going to have to abide by the law. You're going to have to do all the things of the law before you could be a Christian. So this was Judaizers, and uh, that's why it mentions the concision. That's why it's talking about circumcision, and uh, so this was one of their requirements. And uh, so he's beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, and they are considered evil because why? They've added to the gospel. They've taken something that God made simple and they've added to it for their own, uh, I believe it's for their own self-righteous um, ego. Now, I know something about Judaizers. I used to be one. So I know what I'm talking about. You, you have to find people that have problems that they don't fit the mold of what you consider Christian, then you can promote yourself because you look better than they do. My hair is shorter than some, so I'm more spiritual. My my wife is uh, she wears dresses that cover her knee, so she's more spiritual than you are. Uh, the, you know, this is this is they they find little piddly things and they drive you crazy they're like a dog nipping at you i think that's a great illustration he uses dogs uh you ever you ever have eddie and them have a little dog buster right or brutus what's our what's the little dog's name eddie max 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 a little black and white dog and anytime i walk out the door if he sees me here he comes and I mean, he just yep, 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 drives me crazy. I try to talk to him. I've tried to be kind to him. I've done everything I know to do, and he just—I just finally said, "That's just the way it is." But I, you know, little dogs—they just wear you out, you know. 
And uh, this is kind of what these kind of people are like. They just wear you out. They're always finding something to pick on, always. If it's the TV programs you watch or it's the places you go or the place you shop or it can be anything. And they, you know, all of a sudden, you're, you're not near as good as they are because you're, you're wrapped up in these kinds of sins. And uh, so this is a Judaizer to me. That's in, in, in the Christian world, that's what I'd call a Judaizer. They're legalists. They think it's all about legalism. You've got to obey about all these things. Don't, they don't know much about grace. These dogs, they, they are like that. Evil workers, Judaizers, um, yeah, I've already dealt all that. Okay, verse 3. For we, now then Paul says, but we're not that. Why? He says, we are, the, we are the circumcision. We are the circumcision, the true circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. So three things that he brings out there. First, he says, we're of the circumcision. Now, for Paul and many of those that were hearing him, that was a strong statement. Because he's saying it's not about physical circumcision. In fact, he deals with this. It's not about physical circumcision. It's about spiritual circumcision. We've cut away the foreskins of our heart. We've exposed ourselves to God. We've exposed ourselves. We've cut away all the flesh so that now we are one with God. We're one with God. It's a spiritual circumcision, not physical. Thank goodness. Amen. Um, it's, it's, it's a spiritual circumstance. He said, we've done that. Romans chapter 2, verses 25 through 29, if you want to write that out there, that would be where you'll find his discussion of that. And he said, that's, that's, that makes us those who worship God in spirit. We're, we're, about, we're, more about, mm, we're more about a relationship with God that's built on a spiritual basis than on a physical basis. I can, I can do all the things. I can wear collared shirts. I can wear, I can wear ties to every service. I can, you know, I can, I can abide by all the legalism they have. But the truth is, there's no freedom there. There's no, and, and it's not spiritual. It gets to where it's not spiritual at all. It's, it's, it's about rules. I like a spiritual relationship with God. Amen. I, I want that spiritual connection with God. And that's what Paul's saying. We worship God in the spirit, uh, not the outside man. We, we worship him in the inside man, the spirit. And we rejoice in Jesus Christ. We don't rejoice in who we are and what we can do and what we've done. We rejoice in Jesus Christ. My salvation, my joy, my relationships all built on Jesus Christ, not on me. And the reason I can have a great relationship with God is because I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Period. Not because I'm goody, not because I'm a goody two-shoes, not because I do all the right things. It's because I'm, I, have a, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is my access to the Father, not my good works, not my good deeds. So I, I, I rejoice in Jesus Christ. I have no confidence in the flesh. I hope you've come to that place. Amen? I hope you've come to the place you say, you know what, my, my, I've tried everything in the world, and I know that my flesh, the things I can do, don't add up to a hill of beans. It doesn't matter how hard I try, it won't work. Because I can't do it. God has to do it. I, I love visiting with somebody and say, I'm trying so hard. I'm trying so hard to live for Jesus. I'm trying so hard to read my Bible every day. I'm trying so hard. I'm trying so hard. I said, quit trying. You don't have to try anymore. God will do it for you. If you'll just let him. Stop trying. Let God do it. And that's hard for people to understand, but it works. I'm telling you what, if you, ever, if you ever step off in there, if you ever step off that ledge of grace and you find it out there, all of a sudden you go, oh, man, I don't want to go back to that other stuff. I want, I want, I want God to. I find more victory over sin in my life because I give it to God. Just give it to God. He is. I'm done with it. Verse 4. Though I might, have also comp I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he had more of he might trust in the flesh, I more. Now here's what Paul's going to do. Paul's going to say, now I'm going to tell you all something. 
these people, these Judaizers, they've got all these rules, regulations, everything, you know, that says they're more spiritual and everything. Well, he said, let me just tell you something. If there's anybody that can say they live by the flesh, I know what that's like. I know how to do that. I know how to be the goody two-shoe. I know how to, man, remember he, before he was called, before he got called on the road to Damascus, remember he was a, he was a sold out. He was, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was, I mean, he was, in fact, he's going to go through this list. Uh, he says, if any other man thinketh what he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh, I'm more. He said, I, I, I know what it is to live in the flesh. I know how it is to be a goody two-shoe. I know what all those things are. Then he's going to list these for us. Listen to this. Verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. He said, I, I've done all that stuff. I know how to live in the flesh and make it look good. He said, I was, he said as far as a Jew goes, he said, I meet all the qualifications. I was circumcised the eighth day. Now, he didn't have a whole lot to do with that, amen. He was the eighth day of, uh, on his eighth day. No, I don't think he did. Mom and dad did. But anyway, he, he, got, he, he, he was brought up by the rules. He was brought up as a, as a bona fide, certified, 100% orthodox, if you want to call it, Jew. I mean, there, there was no doubt about who he was. And he was circumcised the eighth day, so they couldn't attack him on that. And he says of the stock of Israel, that's his genealogy. That reports back to the fact that he comes from the tribe of Abraham. He's, he understands who he is. He said, I come out of the stock of Israel. And then he says of the tribe of Benjamin. Let me tell you, Benjamin was a neat tribe. My son's named Benjamin, so I know a little bit about this tribe. That, that is a very special tribe out of all the tribes. It's, it's, a, um, it's the second son born to Rachel remember that and um, they were they were tough guys they took pride in being first in the battle if there was a battle you could go to the front of the line and tell you who you're going to find you can find the tribe of Benjamin up there they were they were war horses I mean they they were going to get the job done they weren't afraid to fight they would take it to the you know that's the kind of guys they were they were they were they were sold out to being who they were. So he said, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. That was a prideful thing, to be of the tribe of Benjamin. And he says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was born of a Hebrew. He had parents who brought him up in the Hebrew faith. I mean, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He, he studied Hebrew. He studied under the great Gamaliel. He, he, was a, he was a lawyer. He was a Pharisee. Touching the law, he was a Pharisee. Uh, that was a legalistic fundamentalist of Judaism. I mean, he, he abided by the law. You know, the the Pharisees were. Of course, now Jesus exposed them as hypocrites, but Paul, I'm not sure he was. He, he said, touch the law. I was faithful as a Pharisee. And then concerning zeal, we know about his zeal because he was persecuted the church. I mean, where do we find him in the road to Damascus? He's headed to Damascus to try to attack the church. He's trying to get people. He's trying to find these people that are in the way, which was Christianity, find them and bring them in and persecute them and many died because of his persecution. So he was, he was as far as a true, militaristic, fundamentalist Jew, he, was, he fit the bill. He was everything. So he's saying, I, I am all of those things. And for him, that was his road to success. I mean, he was headed to be a high priest. He was ready. He was moving to be the highest he could get as far as a Jew goes. That's what his goal was. He wanted to succeed. He wanted to be successful as a Jew. And so he had he'd done everything he could to be everything that he wanted to be. And uh, so this was what his goal was. And, uh, and he had invested a lot of time in this. You know, he's not, a, he's not a young man. He's invested his life in this. From when he was a young boy all the way up till now. He's invested his life in this. This isn't something he just decided to do one day. He goes, no, he'd been doing it all his life. He's invested a lot in this. And when God meets him on the road to Damascus and said, I've got a different uh, avenue for you to go down. It changed everything. All the things that were important to him all of a sudden took back seat. In fact, listen to what he says. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss. For Christ. I don't need those things. I don't need to be the pastor of a big church. I don't, need to be, I don't need to be somebody that rules the temple. I don't need to be somebody that's seen as a, as a uh, rabbi. I don't, need to be, I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. 
All I need is Jesus. Amen. That's all I need. So those things that he had invested in now are nothing because of his encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I, I love this passage. I love this, these, these verses we're fixing to get into probably as much as any in the Bible. This is, I think this is where we need to learn to live and breathe right here. What is your goal? Paul said, my goal is to learn everything I can possibly learn about my Lord Jesus Christ. I won't be satisfied until I know everything there is to know about him. That's a big goal, isn't it? In fact, it's an impossible goal. You won't ever reach that. But what an amazing trip it is to invest your life learning the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. There's nothing better than that. You can study science, you can study math, you can study all the computer sciences, you can, you can, you can be an Einstein, but you'll never be more gratified as a Christian than the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Do you know him? I, I, that, to me, I think is the most important thing. I was, again, this is one of those stories I've shared before. This is probably number I don't know, probably 18 C something. <laughs> Ruby and I have been married 13 years, 13 years. And uh, we went to a marriage conference, and we were at the marriage conference, and the fellow was asking questions. He said, how, talk about intimacy. He said, how intimate are you with your mate? How, how much do you know about your mate? I mean, honestly, how much do you know? And he would ask questions, you know, what's her favorite color? Or where does she love to eat? What kind of food does she like? All this. I could answer that, man, bing, 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 bing. I knew all that stuff. Why? Because I knew her. I loved her. I wanted to know everything about her. There wasn't anything that I didn't want to know about. I wanted to know everything about Ruby. And I had, I had taken 13 years. I thought, man, there's nothing you can ask me. I don't know about him. But then he asked this. He said, how long have you been saved? Well, I've been saved since I was nine. I've been married since I was 19. Ten years longer, I'd known the Lord than I knew Ruby. He said, how intimate are you with God? What do you know about him? And I did just what some of, I saw some of you do, bowed my head. It, it shamed me because I thought with all I know about her, because I love her, why don't I know that much about my Lord? Why don't I have that desire for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ? Why don't I have that drive? And you know what you can say all you want to, but for me it was the fact there's a love difference. It had to be. That's all I could say. If I were real honest, I loved Ruby more than I loved my Lord. Or I would, just, or I would actually want to know as much about him as I did about her. Well, I made a change that weekend. I said, that's not going to happen anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn about my Lord. I'm going to learn everything I can about him. And that's where Paul's, that's where he, he took everything that he had invested in before, and he said, I don't care about that. I want, to, I want to have that same knowledge, or even more so, of my Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want. I'm going to invest my time in that. That's what I want to know. You know, there's a lot of things we know a lot about. But we ought to know some. We ought to know Jesus Christ. Amen. The excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung. They weren't worth anything. You know what dung is, right? I mean, all that stuff didn't matter much. It stunk. Phew. Get that out of here. I don't need that. He said, I counted all things. I have suffered the loss of all things. And I, and I, and I just kind of challenge us to think about that because if, if we're going to really have an excellency of the knowledge of Christ, we're going to have to come to a place where all things are lost. We've got to put them in the lost column. You know what I'm saying? And some of those things are hard to do. They say, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, I, I can do that. I can do that. I can give this one up. I can give that one up. I don't know about that one. I'm going to hang on to that one. Excellency means excellent means complete, perfect, everything. 
If I want to know everything about Jesus, I've got to give up everything to get there. And that's what Paul did. He said, I've given up, I've done, I do count them but dung, why? That I may win Christ. What great terminology. When you win something, it is something you don't pay for. It's something God gives you. That I may win Christ. It's not about the work I do. It's about learning about grace, learning to receive all that Jesus Christ gives us. And you know what? It's really cool. I want to share this with you. This was really cool. This week I had a situation. I was counseling a guy. And we were talking about a situation in, in his relationship with another person. And he was talking about how he was just struggling, struggling, struggling. He said, I don't understand. He said, I'm trying to hard to do this and do that, do that. And we came up with a couple of ideas about how to better make a better. But I said, in the end, and, and I was praying the whole time, God, give me some wisdom. And, I, and God in the middle of that said, here's, here's what you need to recognize, Jim. I'm doing this. I'm taking their relationship to a new level. And they don't see it. That's pretty cool. They're struggling. They've got these little battles going on between them. And all it is is God saying, I'm moving them to a new level. And they're just having a tough time getting there. Help them see that. Help them see that this is God moving them to a new level of knowledge. And most of the things we go through is God doing something to teach us something you can't teach us any other way, right? Did y'all see the Did y'all see the little thing on Facebook about the um, uh, the glow stick? Yes. Some of you saw it. You didn't. Okay. I'm gonna teach you. I'm gonna teach you something. This is cool. Said the lady was in the dollar. He was in the dollar store and she was walking around. And all of a sudden, she saw this older boy with his little brother, and the older boy had. A package of those glow sticks and the little brother wanted one and he was arguing and fighting crying screaming finally the mother turned around to open the package and handed him the glow stick and the little boy was just elated oh he just thought this was great and he was walking around with a glow stick he was just sucking on it you know thought it was wonderful pretty soon big brother reached down picked it pick it back up the little boy just started whining crying going crazy again and um, they got out to the car and uh the big brother took it and broke it in half. No, no, no. Y'all don't know anything about glow sticks. <laughs> broke it in half and gave it to the little brother. Now it's glowing. And the, little bro the big brother said to Mama, Mama, I just wanted to have it better. I wanted to understand how much better it'd be once it's broken. And, of course, the illustration is that God wants us to have the best but sometimes the only way he can give us the best is to break it to break it so that we can see the beauty and we can fulfill the purpose for that that glow stick was not made to be unbroken it was made its purpose was to be broken that was its purpose and it couldn't fulfill its purpose till it was broken and you we can't and i know this is true in my you can't fulfill the purpose which god made you till he breaks you Dr. Blackaby, Experiencing God, if you haven't taken it, we're going to offer it again because it's such a good Bible study. One of the things he says, he said, he said, God can't use you, and God can't use you greatly until he hurts you deeply. And I remember when I read that, I thought, That's, I don't like that. But I know it's true. And it's just like the glow stick. God has a purpose, but you won't find it until God has the ability to break you and fulfill you, that purpose in you to do it. I thought that was a great illustration, that I may win Christ. Then verse 9 says, And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That's the righteousness that we need to walk in. That's the righteousness that we need to live in. It's not righteousness we can produce. It's righteousness that God produces in us and through us around us we want to take credit when we do something right when you can take credit for it God didn't do it right. when you can take credit for it God didn't do it it's only when you realize I couldn't have done that and God says I know but isn't it great we made it happen and righteousness is that truth because we don't have any righteousness Isaiah uh, 
Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteousness but filthy rags. The best that we can do is filthy rags. But it's whenever God, he fills us with his righteousness. And that's, Paul understood that. He grabs that and says, man, I, I've got this. Not being found, found in him, not having my own righteousness. Because if you're going to be found in Jesus, you're not going to have your own righteousness. Which is of the law, all the things that he had described earlier. But that which is through the faith of Christ. What a trade we got, amen? The righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10, that I may know him. You know, when I read that, I go, wait a minute, Paul, hold it. Just stop, 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 stop. Didn't you write 13 of the 27 New Testament books? Uh, I, 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 through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Yes, yeah, I did. I did. You, you teach more doctrine to the church than any other apostle, any other writer. We get all of our doctrine from what you wrote. Well... That's probably true. Just remember, I wrote it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I, I understand that. I'm, but you say that you want to know him? You don't know him? There's no way. If you don't know him, I'm never going to get to know him. You ought to know him. Amen? That's what I thought when I read that. That I may know him. Paul says that I may know him. Well, again, we go back to where he says... For the excellency and knowledge of Christ. He wants to know him. He said, oh, that I might know him. And the power. And that, that know there is that intimacy I talked about. I want to know him intimately. I want to know everything about him. I want to, feel, I want to be able to discern his voice. You know what? I had a professor in college. Um, and uh, he said, I, I, I decided I wanted to learn the voice of God. So he said, what I did is I took a $5 bill. And I'd pull it in my wallet, and I would pray over it every day. Lord, if, if there's someone you want me to give that to, speak to my heart, and I'll give that to them. And he said, I'd carry that around. And he said, one night, he said he was in the balcony of the church, and he was sitting there looking at his Bible, waiting for the service to start. And this little gal came up and walked beside him. And he said, I sense the Spirit of God say she needs that $5 bill. He thought for a second, I wonder, if I, did I really hear the voice of God or am I just assuming, you know? So he gets up and he follows up there and she sits down and he said, I, I need to tell you why I'm here. I've asked God to reveal his voice to me. And when you walk by, I sense God wanted me to give you this $5 bill. She began to cry. She said, well... She said, I wanted to come to church tonight so bad. And she said, I only had enough gas to get here. I wasn't going to have enough gas to get home. And before I left, I prayed, Lord, please take care of this for me. She said, God just did that when he told you to give me that final. And that was his desire to know the voice of God. That's pretty impressive, I thought. I thought, man, that's cool. Go ahead and put you a $100 bill in your back pocket and see what happens. See if God doesn't tell you to give it to somebody. Amen. He'll do it. He'll do it. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Is there any greater power than the power of the resurrection? No. That is the greatest power that we can talk about, the power of the resurrection. Jesus Christ was dead, D-E-A-D, -E dead. He wasn't swooning. He wasn't, you know, in some kind of uh, uh, stupor. He was dead. He'd stopped breathing. His heart had quit pumping. He was dead. And God resurrected him. There's no greater power. Nobody can reproduce it. Only God can do it. It is the greatest power. Now, here's the problem with the resurrection. If you want to experience the power of the resurrection, what must you do? Die. 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 The only way you're going to experience the resurrection is if you die. Now, you say, are, you, are we forming a suicide pact? No, we're not. Because there is a death to self. And until we die to self, we'll never experience the spiritual resurrection that God wants us to have. And when we finally die to self, we know self has to be put in the grave, laid in a casket, casket door closed and we no longer visit that old 
sorry piece of flesh, we then can begin to experience the power of the resurrection. That's when that happens. So he said that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, I know a lot of people, they want, I'd like to, I'd like to know Jesus like Paul did. Really? <laughs> Are you willing to go through what he went to to get to know Jesus, you know? I mean, we can go back and read all the things. He was, he was beaten within an inch of his life. He was stoned. He was left dead. He was, he was persecuted. He was, he was shipwrecked. I mean, all the things. And people say, oh, i just love to know Jesus. Well, would you like to? No, no, I don't want to go that far. But see, Paul, he said he, he found fellowship in his sufferings. <laughs> that's, that's the coolest thing in the world. And I tell you this, there is a fellowship in the sufferings. Whenever we finally get to the place where we can look at the suffering of our life, whatever it may be, as the opportunity to experience God in, in a way we've never experienced before, there is a fellowship there. There is something special there. The things I, I've been through in the past of my life that are just, I don't want to go there again. I told the Lord, please don't ever, let, I don't want to visit that one again. But Lord, thank you because in that moment you taught me something about you I couldn't learn any other way. The greatest lessons, the greatest gifts God gives us are many times in times of suffering. In fact, I would say, I would say all the time. I, maybe I'm out on a limb there, but the greatest gifts he gives us, he gives us through suffering. We learn about him, and we learn about how to go through that. We learn about his grace and his mercy. We learn about his, his care for us. We learn about the Holy Spirit who comforts us through those times. There's no greater time to be with God than when we're going through those times of suffering. So that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, and be made conformable unto his death. Conformable, that's obedient. That I might be obedient unto his death. Did Paul want to die? No. But would he? Yes. He wanted to have that kind of resolve. There's nothing going to stop me from living for Jesus, he's saying. Nothing. I'm, I'm sold out. I'm going all the way. I'm, I'm in this to win it. I'm in it to stay. I'm not getting out. I'm, I'm going all the way. If it means my life, that's fine too. I will be obedient unto death even, he says. I'm going to stop there. Verse 10. This is all about knowing Jesus better. Every bit of that is about learning about God, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. That's what that's about. Amen? All right, any question, comment, or thought? If you're going to raise your hand, we're going to get a mic to you because we want to make sure we can get it right down front. That way they can see and hear you online. Yes, I did. I'm going to make you walk back, too. Um, there's been so many blessings, and I, I can't even begin to tell you, but that about what you go through, you have no control over. You know, I've been in agonizing pain that I could hardly even walk. And this week, I said, I'm sorry, Lord. I took my eyes off of you. Mm. That's what I need to be focusing yeah, on. Yeah, that's right. And it is better when you do that. Sure. I mean, it's all encompassing, but you cannot give in to it. Amen. Circumstances can't control. Yes, sir. Just can't do it. Amen. Somebody else? Question, comment, or thought? Anybody? Going once. Oh, there we go. Hank? Um, <clears throat> The things I've been going through lately have uh, have been emotionally draining, physically draining. Uh, you know, I could be the heat, but uh, I uh, the I can see them forming into things that will teach me as I go along. Mm -hmm. And I come to the point to where the only thing that I, you know, I have to do is to not give up. I mean, we can see these things in front of us and we think, oh man, this is overwhelming. I can't do this. Uh, you know, uh, will this ever end? Uh, you know, stuff like that. But it will end. Yeah. It will, it will do what it has to do. And sometimes you just have to be still and know God is God. Amen. I mean, that's it. That's right. Be still and know that I'm God, he says. Be still. 
That's a major part of it. Let pa patience have her perfect work. Let patience have her perfect work. How does that happen? When we are still long enough for God to do what he was going to do. Don't move. Just be still. Wait on. All right? Is that it? Let's stand and be dismissed word of prayer. Thank you for being here. Choir practice tonight, so uh, hang around and uh, be, be ready to get in the choir and get with it, okay? All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for the day. I thank you, Lord, for this night. I thank you for what we've learned from the Scripture. What a powerful passage for us to deal with. Many of us, Father, go through things every day, and many times, Father, we give way to the circumstances, allowing them to rob us of our joy, or some person will come along and rob us of our joy. Our, our, Lord, there's just so many things we allow to rob us of our joy, but our joy is found in you, not in our circumstances. May we walk in that truth this week, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.